first of all, I want to say uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. I've been here for almost a month now, and it's uh, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun and very relaxing, and uh, it's a really great place to be. Um, I'll be sad to go in a few days. Um, so today and uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, I'm going to talk about uh, the Vlasa Maxwell system and the whole space. Uh, <laughs> I also, oh, also want to say thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me and for putting together this great uh, workshop and uh, this great semester program. Uh, I feel like I've benefited a lot from being here and uh, I've learned a lot from talking to a lot of smart people. Um, so uh, today, so the Vasa Maxwell system is a uh, complicated system of partial differential equations that uh, I started studying a few years ago. I've written uh, two papers on the subject so far, and um, both of them are in collaboration with uh, Jonathan Luke, who is uh, at Cambridge right now. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you about those later, but today I'm basically going to try to teach you about the equation and teach you about what's been known uh, in the past and how uh, I'm going to try to give you a picture about how some of the proof wor proofs work. I can't uh, give you too many details, but I'll try to uh, give you a broad overview. Um, so that's why I'm using slides. So to start, the Vlasov equation, uh, which was um, derived by Vlasov in 1938, although people um, in the West, as far as I understand, didn't really know about it until 19, around 1946 when it was uh, translated into English. Uh, looks like a simple uh, linear uh, transport equation. You have a DTF uh, plus P hat, I'll explain what that is soon, plus the gradient XF plus uh, capital F, which is uh, another function, uh, uh, dot product with the gradient of P is it? of lowercase f is equal to zero here, uh, lowercase f is your unknown that you'll solve for. Um, and this is uh, nowadays considered to be one of the fundamental models for a plasma. A plasma is, uh, a, is modeled as a large number of particles, say on the order of 10 to the 23rd. All of them are very, very small uh, and they're uh, occupying a very small amount of uh, say in a box, they're occupying a very small amount of space in that box, uh, but there are a lot of them, and they're moving very fast. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so that would happen if uh, the plasma is sufficiently rarefied or sufficiently hot, um, so that you can uh, think of temperatures, uh, uh, excuse me, you can think of speeds uh, very close to the speed of light. That's why we are relativistic. And then in this situation, you can neglect uh, collisions between particles, and that's why you have a zero on the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, if you want to include collisions, then you would get a, a more complicated model, of which there are a lot. Uh, some of them I worked on myself. And uh, so then uh, the only way that this equation is nonlinear and the only interaction between uh, particles is through a collectively generated field, which is capital F. Uh, which is a function of t time x and a lowercase f, which is itself a function of t, x, and p, but the only way the field is a function of p is through a lowercase f. So here, uh, t is time, x is space, and p is a momentum. Um, so this is the system. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of examples of where this comes up physically. I won't spend too much time on that, but a couple of things you can think about that you might know about already is the solar wind or a uh, powered up fusion reactor. This would be a, reason a reasonable model for uh, particles interaction, interacting in a fusion reactor like you might find at CERN. Uh, okay, so um, Let's uh, show you a relaxing picture. This is Vlasov and Maxwell. Uh, these are, so uh, I showed you the Vlasov equation that was uh, derived by uh, Vlasov. And then uh, we're going to talk about Vlasov Maxwell today. And the Maxwell's equations were derived by James uh, Clerk Maxwell in the 1800s. Uh, actually, there are a lot of pictures of Maxwell um, if you Google, but uh, 
a long time ago, I tried to Google for pictures of Vlasov, and uh, I actually spent a good amount of time on it. And this is the only one that I could find. I don't know uh, how to find more. But anyway, those are the two guys. They are the heroes of this equation. Okay, so uh, for a while, I'm going to tell you about a collection of uh, Vlasov models and a sample of results. There's a lot of uh, models in this area, and uh, so I'll tell you about some of them. Uh, the main one is uh, the relativistic Vlasov-Maxwell system uh, in 3D. So here you have uh, the Vlasov equation that I already told you about at the top, but then you have this uh, uh, thing called the Lorenz force, which is E plus P hat cross B um, dotted with gradient P. That would be the replacement of your capital F, and you also have this parameter gamma in here. Um, gamma normally takes uh, two values, plus one and minus one. Uh, when you normalize all the physical constants, plus one uh, is thought to be stable, and minus one is thought to be uh, unstable, but there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And then you couple these with Maxwell's equations. These are just the standard linear Maxwell's equations. Uh, partial T E plus the curl of B minus J. Um, and then partial T B is equal to minus the curl of E. And you have these constraints. Uh, the divergence of E is equal to rho, and the divergence of B is equal to zero. Uh, here, uh, rho is the charge density, and it's a it's the integral of f with respect to p, where p is a momentum variable. Now you see that p is in R3. Uh, I'm normalizing a lot of the physical constants to uh, simplify the presentation. And then the current density is a vector, as it has to be, because it's uh, coupled with Maxwell's equations, and e and b are all three-dimensional vectors. Um, and it's uh, so each component of it, i equals one, two, three, is of the form p hat i uh, times f of t x p uh, integrated against dp. And uh, so these are the charge and the current. So then Maxwell's equations are linear in E and B, but they have this uh, nonlinear uh, forcing in terms of j and p, the charge and the current. And then that's uh, plugged back into the relativistic, uh, the relativistic Vlasov Maxwell equation for lowercase f. And so this uh, gradient p term at the top ends up being a nas the nasty nonlinear uh, contribution to this uh, theory. And that's the reason why uh, the large data problem for this equation in 3D is still uh, uh, completely open. Um, and so this is really the hard, uh, big uh, open problem in this area is the large data 3D existence and uniqueness problem um, in the context of classical solutions. Okay, so uh, the momentum is a P. As I've said, P is a three-dimensional vector. Then the velocity is a P hat, which is P over P zero. Actually, um, you won't see this notation in the um, physics literature very much. As far as I'm aware, this uh, P hat notation be the physics literature may use p hat for something else, actually. But this uh, p hat notation, as far as I'm aware, was introduced by uh, Glassy and Strauss um, in their uh, early works on this equation in the 80s. Um, and so p hat is p over p0. Um, p and p0 is the relativistic energy. It's the square root of 1 plus p squared. I'm uh, hiding uh, the speed of light. Um, it should be present in the whole equation, but it's not. It's normalized equal to 1 here. Um, and so in the relativistic case, velocities are uh, bounded by the speed of light, which in this case is 1. Um, and uh, so this is the full model. Um, oh, as I said before, gamma equal plus 1 is a plasma physics case. In that case, uh, stability is expected. and. Uh, gamma equal minus 1 is the uh, stellar dynamics case. And in that case, uh, instability might be expected for certain initial data. You have examples of that um, in the, for relativistic uh, Vlasov Poisson that I'll mention uh, later. And uh, OK, so you might ask, well, there are these constraints here. 
um, uh, how do you satisfy those? Well, it turns out that there's, a, uh, there's another equation that you can derive for rho and a j that is a consequence of this system, and that equation itself uh, predicts that uh, the constraints are uh, propagated by the equation if they're satisfied uh, initially, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, yeah. So that's uh, relativistic class of Maxwell in 3D. Oh, I should say, especially for students in the audience, I'm uh, really happy to uh, answer questions, and I often find it uh, easier to answer questions uh, on the spot rather than uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, if you please feel free to uh, raise your hand. I'm happy to try to answer uh, any questions that you may have. OK, so this is relativistic class of Maxwell. Um, so it, that's what that actually was, was so-called one species relativistic loss of Maxwell for one particle. Uh, if you, again, if you look in the physics literature, most of the time you don't really see one species loss of Maxwell. What you see is uh, n species loss of Maxwell, or uh, as I'm calling here, many species loss of Maxwell. So you actually have uh, n equations. So alpha represents any integer between 1 and n, then uh, dt f alpha plus p sub alpha hat yeah, plus dot gradient x f alpha is equal to uh, nm plus gamma e plus p hat cross b dot gradient p f alpha equals zero and that represents n different equations and then you have the same Maxwell's equations and the same uh, divergence conditions and here the velocity uh, p hat alpha is p over the square root of m alpha plus p absolute value p squared and m alpha is uh, represents the mass of uh, each individual uh, different particle that you are modeling here. And then the only difference here is you have the charge and the current and there now the charge is a sum of the f alphas and e alpha where e alpha is a uh, physical constant and the current is uh, j which is a similar sum of e alpha and p hat alpha times f alpha. And so all of the uh, unknowns are summed here in this way. And uh, normally, uh, in the rest of the talks, I'm only considering the one species case. Normally, for uh, many types of results that you prove for these systems, it's sufficient because of the structure of the equations uh, to just uh, write your proof out carefully in the one species case, and then things continue to work in the uh, many species case, although that does uh, need to be checked on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, OK, so that's the full system. Um, and uh, now I'll give you a very incomplete and very short uh, list of previous results uh, for this equation. Um, so it, it, it turns out that not many uh, different um, families of people have worked on this equation. So there's a uh, school. Um, uh, there's actually a couple of schools coming out of a couple uh, chains of schools coming out of France. Like, uh, one uh, really uh, school coming out of the U.S. There's a, and then there's another school coming out of Germany, and um, that really win you. And then there's uh, some new papers by some people in uh, Canada, um, but that really encompasses most of the mathematical work on. Uh, Loss of Maxwell it is not the field where you have uh, thousands of papers. Um, and so you have uh, De Pernelions, uh, Glassy Strauss, and then Glassy Schaefer. Uh, Strauss uh, was the advisor of Glassy, and then Glassy was the advisor of Schaefer. And uh, Gerhard Brein uh, comes out of uh, this is German school. Um, uh, and uh, actually, I'll tell you about a lot of these papers later on, so uh, let me not uh, mention them. Uh, in too much detail. You also have uh, results on Glass of Poisson. Um, uh, I won't really read the names because uh, in an uh, upcoming slide I'll tell you more about uh, these people and what they did. Um, okay, so uh, this is Glass of Poisson and um, Studying scaling, uh, so scaling is a huge tool in uh, nonlinear partial differential equations. Um, for relativistic loss of Maxwell, it's hard to really uh, effectively uh, find a way to quantify how to use scaling. Um, 
In particular, because uh, if you legitimately rescale uh, Vlasov Maxwell, uh, you get and you you get Vlasov Poisson, so you get a completely different equation. The equation is not uh, in some, in certain senses, the equation is not really even scale invariant. Although you can, uh, that's not. Uh, there are things you can do, like consider massless um, relativistic class of Maxwell. Uh, we're not doing that, but uh, I'm just I just wanted to make the point that uh, it's not completely easy just to uh, derive heuristics from scaling for relativistic class of Maxwell because uh, when you rescale, you get class of Poisson, and here is class of Poisson. So uh, you have DTF plus now you, we change P to V. Um, so actually, most people who study uh, Lassa Maxwell mathematically also use V. Um, I happen to prefer the P notation because it comes from physics, and then uh, you can differentiate between the variable in V and the variable in P. So V is a three vector, and you get V dot grad X F plus gamma E dot grad V F equals zero, and so this. So the sending the speed of light to infinity kills the uh, magnetic B term, and you're only left with the electric E term. And here you have gradient x dot E is equal to rho, and E is equal to minus the gradient x dot phi, where phi is a potential that I'll tell you more about. And then you, always, you continue to have the same charge, except we change the notation. It's the integral of dV. Um, and then you continue to have uh, the integral of FTV. Uh, okay, so now um, in comparison to uh, Vlasov uh, Maxwell, where the uh, large data problem, which is the big open problem in the field, uh, although there are others, that's really the most uh, visible one. Uh, for that uh, problem, it's open for Vlasov Maxwell, for Vlasov Poisson, the problem has been closed since uh, the late 80s and the early 90s. And you have this uh, paper by Leons Pertham, and they can prove. Uh, global classical solutions via the propagation of high uh, momentum uh, moments in the whole space. Um, and this, this is really non-relativistic. Uh, um, and then uh, at the same time, uh, roughly, you have uh, this uh, Fafamosa result um, from 92 and uh, Schaefer's simplification of Fafamosa's proof from 91. Uh, you have to explain why the simplification was published before the uh, actual paper, but it was. Um, they ha he has global classical solutions via bounding the momentum support. Um, so Fevel Moser is this uh, very interesting guy who came out of the German school uh, that I told you about before. Uh, his, this, this paper was his a PhD thesis, and it took a long time to publish, um, and uh, he wrote very few other papers, and uh, he, he's not in math anymore. And Schaefer uh, uh, simplified his proof. Uh, this, this is, it's really much shorter, and, and he acknowledges uh, that he, he was simplifying Fafamosa's proof. Um, and uh, just because of the speed of the way things get published, his paper was published first. Um, so fa the Fafamosa Schaefer theory is uh, compact support, compactly supported. Uh, Initial data and the Leon's Pertham theory is uh, non-compactly supported initial data. The, um, um, so that's a real advantage of non-compactly supported initial data. On the other hand, uh, as far as I know, it uses it is their proof uses dispersion in a fundamental way, and uh, it's uh, still uh, unknown uh, whether or not their proof can be generalized to uh, other domains in the whole space whereas the Fafamosa Schaefer's theory works in, say, the torus and the whole space. OK, so another thing you can say about, uh, so these, uh, these uh, large data theories work uh, in both the stable and the unstable case, so both for gamma equal plus 1 and minus 1. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have blow up when gamma equals minus 1. Uh, you can do that uh, roughly. Uh, OK, so you can have blow up and uh, global existence for the same model in the same spaces. Uh, this blow up on gamma equals minus 1 is actually for the relativistic uh, Vlasov Poisson. It's not for the uh, uh, Newtonian Vlasov Poisson that you see here. So you replace V with, with, v with uh, p hat, p over p0. And then uh, you have uh, 
gold, uh, those are very rough results of Horst, and uh, these are they explained very nicely in Glassy's 1996 book. Um, and then you, this is, uh, this is these are more of existence uh, proofs of uh, blow up. Uh, so the point is that when gamma equals minus one, the uh, the energy of this system is negative, and you can calculate the energy and it's negative, and you can use that to prove that the lifespan of solutions is finite. And then uh, in 2008, uh, Limou, Mehas, Raphael uh, proved a stable, self-similar blow-up for uh, relativistic Lasso Poisson and for a massless uh, scale a invariant version of relativistic Lasso Poisson. So they have uh, these very nice uh, profile decompositions like you saw in uh, the earlier talks of, um, uh, from the first few days of uh, several people um, and uh, then for this model another thing you can talk about Landau damping uh, you have the big uh, initial uh, proof of Mohovalani from uh, 2009 and uh, then there was a quiet period for a couple of years and now there's an explosion of works on both uh, Landau damping for the Lassa Poisson equation and for uh, an ore damping for uh, to the uh, fluids, uh, you saw um, Professor Masmoudi's series of talks on that, so I won't really. Uh, and there's uh, like a huge number of uh, people who have worked on that both before and after uh, Mohovalani, so I won't. Uh, instead of just mentioning a few names, I will uh, not mention any. <laughs> um, okay, so this is uh, Vlasov Poisson. Uh, actually, if there's time, I'll come back to this uh, later. Uh, I don't know if I will. But, uh, okay, so now I'm going to return uh, to relativistic Vlasov Maxwell with, uh, in the stable case uh, with uh, gamma equal plus one. I'm just going to show you the equation again uh, so that uh, you don't forget it. Um, Okay, so how do you study this? Uh, well, one thing you can do is uh, derive uh, conservation laws. Um, and it turns out that like uh, many wave equations, uh, there are a lot of conservation laws for Vlasov Maxwell. Some of them may be uh, more useful uh, than others. Um, uh, in particular, some of them may be not useful at all. Um, but uh, it turns out that uh, <coughs> Uh, there's this uh, old paper from, um, I think it's 1984 of Glassy and Strauss, uh, where they derive a huge number of conservation laws for Vlasov Maxwell. And many of them have uh, never been used, um, or people don't know how to use them. But so, uh, so normally you think that uh, all of the conservation laws are known uh, by the physicists long ago, but. Uh, Actually I, lo actually, I looked in a lot of the physics literature and I didn't see many of these conservation laws. I don't know if they just knew them or they didn't bother to derive them or what. But uh, many of the conservation laws that you find were, the, the first place that I found them was in this 1984 paper. Of course, the big ones were known forever, like the energy. Uh, but so you have this, um, this equation uh, for the energy density, like you have E, you can define E to be one half E squared plus P squared plus four pi, uh, the integral of P zero F, and then you take a time derivative of this, and you can see directly from the equation that this uh, is equal to a divergence of uh, E cross B um, plus the integral of P K F uh, dP, as you see up there. Um, so this is an exact equation that can be uh, derived. And uh, okay, so if you have uh, sufficient decay conditions, then you automatically get the uh, L2 conservation of E and B in R3, and the P0F uh, conservation of uh, the BDX uh, integrated against the BDX. This is equal to a constant. The constant is the uh, initial data of the similar terms. Uh, this is just easy integration. Um, and then this term, uh, as long as you can get this term to disappear by integration by parts, then uh, you're in good shape. 
Okay, so you have an, you also have another much less well known uh, conservation law that's um, is actually not a conservation law. It's a uh, quantity that remains finite uh, by the uh, propagation of the equation. So I'll tell you about this. You have um, um, I call this the good conservation law and. Um, this, uh, and uh, this is it. So uh, uh, here, CTX is uh, the backward light cone emigrating, emanating from TX. This is what you get. This is the domain that you integrate over when you integrate the, when you invert the 3D wave equation um, with zero initial data. Um, it's just, uh, it's the cone not including the interior. So you integrate from uh, 0 to t and you integrate on the uh, exterior of the cone or the absolute value of y minus x is equal to t minus s and then uh, you have the outward normal to the two sphere which is uh, the uh, unit vector y minus x um, and then uh, you can uh, so what you do is you uh, take the previous um, equation that I wrote down for e and you integrate against the whole cone, um, not just the exterior, and then uh, you use the divergence theorem and you integrate by parts, and you get this, and you do a complicated uh, two-page calculation, um, and you get uh, that these quantities are positive and bounded above by a constant which depends on the initial data minus another concept which depends on the solution but it's also positive so you can throw it away um, and um, it's not bounded by anything so you don't want to keep it here but you get e dot omega squared plus b dot omega squared plus e minus omega cross b squared plus b plus omega cross e squared um, then you integrate over this domain and then you get p hat p zero plus one plus p hat dot omega squared f d p d sigma, and uh, this is a beautiful uh, conservation law that's uh, very useful in several contexts. Um, as far as I know, it's only been used in four papers in the field, um, uh, well, maybe five if you count two of them as one or one of them as two. Excuse me, um, but it's not perfect because uh, two independent components of E and B are missing. Um, so it does not control all of E and B on uh, the backward light cone. Um, but on the other hand, many terms, as we'll see uh, coming up, many terms to estimate involve integrals over the backward light cone, which make, will make this conservation law very uh, useful. Um, Okay, so I can't explain that yet, but uh, you'll see eventually. So also there are characteristics for the Lasso Maxwell system and they're written down as follows. I use a capital X and capital V and capital V hat, um, where V capital V hat is just uh, V over uh, the square root of one plus V squared and the characteristics are D X of T equals D V equals V hat and D V of T is equal to E of x of t evaluated x of t v hat cross b evaluated x of t and um, we abbreviate uh, x of t and v of t for simplicity as x of t s x p and v of t s x p and uh, the characteristics really depend on all of these things um, and you have what are not exactly initial conditions but like initial conditions that say that uh, when you have x of t, t, x, p, and v of t, t, x, p, then that is exactly equal to lowercase x and lowercase p, which are just the variables. Um, this is basic uh, characteristics 101 stuff. Um, but we will also use uh, these uh, forward characteristics. That's when you start with s equals 0 and you go forward in t. And the backward characteristics, that's when you are at t and you go backwards to 0. Um, then with this notation of forward and back, back to backward characteristics uh, for a solution to Vlasa Maxwell, it turns out that uh, you can express it as the initial data 
f of t x p is the initial data um, evaluated at capital X and capital V. So the, uh, you can you also do things like this for uh, like 2D Euler in uh, vorticity formulation and things like that. So you can simply express the solution as the initial data, but it's evaluated at the backward characteristic. So all of the information about the uh, dynamics is hiding here in the backward characteristics. Um, okay, so it turns out that uh, the Jacobian of uh, this uh, X and V transformation, particularly at TT, is the, uh, is the uh, identity matrix. And then when you try to calculate the dynamics of the Jacobian, uh, you see that it doesn't change. Um, I won't actually do that calculation, but it can be done. So at least formally, assuming you have a nice enough solution, then the, uh, this change of variable here, the, the, these equations here, when you further differentiate them with respect to x and p and do some uh, clever calculations, you get uh, that the, uh, the Jacobian determinant is the same as it was initially. And so it's uh, just an identity. So this, uh, these characteristics are formally, assuming you have a nice enough solution, uh, so-called measure preserving. And uh, when, you have a, when you have this expression here for f, and when you have uh, the, these sort of LQ uh, spaces, uh, you, you just plug in the, you, you, can pl you take the uh, f of LQ norm, you plug in the, this expression here, you apply the change of variables uh, that I just mentioned, and the Jacobian is 1. And so the, uh, every single LQ norm is uh, conserved. Uh, this is another collection of conservation laws. This is just because it's divergence free, right? Yeah. Well, because, uh, well, because what's divergence free? Oh, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is true for a lot of, right. Yeah, you can say it that way. So I mean, somehow you don't need to, I mean, you don't need to do any calculation. You just say it's divergence free, so it's conserves. Sure. Conserves. Sure. Yeah. This is, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, either because uh, the vector field is divergence free, or because you can calculate the Jacobian exactly, and see that it's uh, kind of it's propagated to be the same as the initial data, then you get that these uh, these are measure preserving. Um, and uh, the most uh, popular conservation law in this business is often the L infinity uh, conservation law, which says that uh, the uh, L infinity norms are just bounded. Um, okay, so you have some more conservation laws that are used less um, uh, that I'll tell you about quickly. So uh, since the characteristics of Vasa Maxwell are measure preserving, uh, for a almost arbitrary f, but it's just a function of all of f, then uh, the dx and the dp norm of a of f is uh, conserved, just the same exact way that the lp norms uh, are conserved. Um, so this is uh, another conservation law for all of these uh, Vlasov systems, not just for Vlasov Maxwell or Vlasov Poisson. Um, and lastly, there is a uh, relatively less known and less used Morowitz type uh, inequality. So uh, you c there's a lot of Morowitz types inequalities for this. There's, this is just one. Uh, so if you integrate from uh, 0 to infinity of time and you integrate over x dx over x cubed, and you get e dot x squared plus b dot x squared, uh, and then you uh, write p hat dot x squared f integrate against dp just for this term, then that's uh, bounded. Um, I think people were um, really happy to have this conservation law when they when it was uh, found, uh, but as far as I know, it hasn't been uh, for in this business. It hasn't been used. Yes. Uh, is there, there is no theory like scattering that infinity for when it's global uh, using this kind of thing? You would like to have things like that. I mean, you, so there are a lot of uh, 
bad things that can happen in plasmas, you have uh, a lot of steady states. Um, you have these uh, BGK type equilibria and you have other things. And you have, um, so you can't, uh, so you have to be more careful when you just try to talk about a statement like, uh, do you have scattering or not? But yeah, I mean, formally you expect um, once you know the uh, global regularity, then you expect to be able to say a lot, hope to be able to say a lot more things. And uh, I mean, you do have uh, uh, several small data theories that I can tell you about, and you have uh, decay, and uh, you can work on problems like scattering for those and things like that. But um, no, I mean, as far as I'm aware, they don't really uh, use this uh, conservation law uh, yet. I mean, it's something you can try to do in the future. Um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you about a few different uh, theories um, of solutions. Actually, I'll tell you about three. Um, the first one that I'll tell you about is the uh, 1989 Dupont Leon's theory of weak solutions. Uh, for this one, I'll be uh, brief. So if you uh, so for weak solutions, you uh, satisfy the equation uh, in the sense of distribution. So you multiply uh, the equation by a test function, and you integrate by parts, and you put the derivatives on the test functions. All the test functions are compactly supported, so you don't really worry so much about what happens at infinity. And then uh, you have the following theorem. So if you assume that initially the L-infinity norm is bounded, and you assume that the uh, L2 norms of E and B are uh, bounded, and the uh, first moment of F is bounded in the P and the X integral, uh, then uh, you can have a uh, weak solution for arbitrary initial data. Um, and so, given uh, so for these solutions, you know it's the equation is satisfied in the weak sense, and the equation is uh, known to be a positive, and it's known to uh, uh, and uh, it's known to be satisfied for almost every time, and you have, uh, for almost every time, you have that the conservation laws uh, continue to be finite. Um, so that's good. Um, the big open question for weak solutions is, of course, the uniqueness and the long time uh, pointwise behavior of solutions. And that's, that's not just a big open problem here, it's a big open problem for many uh, theories of weak solutions. Um, okay, so that's uh, weak solutions. Um, uh, de Bernard Leons did this in 1989 for the non-relativistic Vlasov Maxwell system. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, for weak solutions, uh, the difference between uh, relativistic and non-relativistic is not a big deal because uh, you have a compact. You're multiplying by a compactly supported test function, and so you're basically working in compactly in uh, the compact support setting, but at the same time, Ryan uh, wrote a so expository paper in 2004 with uh, basically De Prenne-Leon's proof, and he wanted to sort of uh, revitalize the uh, subject and bring new students into it, and he explained uh, the proof in the relativistic case. Um, okay, so uh, I can quickly um, give you a one-slide explanation of how this uh, works. Um, so you regularize uh, the relativistic class of Maxwell system. You write down a different system of equations that happens to have uh, classical solutions that are smooth in some sense. And uh, you call that system Fn, En, and Bn, and it's satisfied for every n. And you prove that for the regularized system, you have uniform bounds on the conservation laws. Uh, this uh, gives you control to take limits. Uh, and then uh, you have this uh, averaging lemma. This was really a key uh, contribution. At the time, there were a lot of different averaging lemmas. And, but this was the one that they used. So if you have a uh, solution h to the following linear system, dth plus p hat that grad xh is equal to g0 plus gradient g1, where uh, this, if this set of equations is satisfied in the sense of distributions, um, where you only assume that h, g0, and g1 are L2 functions, where you will 
they only need to be L2 in the V variable and a compact ball, say center at the origin, but you don't care, but they're L2 in uh, the whole time and the whole space. Uh, then uh, when averaged against a, a test function, you go from L2 to H1 quarter, roughly, um, in T and X. So this is, uh, this is, this is basically proved uh, by using the Fourier transform. Uh, it's sort of, uh, in some sense, a uh, related uh, very loosely to the uh, Landau damping or OR damping type of phenomenon where you have this transfer of uh, uh, Fourier modes and that uh, gives you a little bit of regularity. Um, and then once you have this H1 quarter regularity, then uh, you have uh, enough compactness to take uh, limits strongly in some sense. And the, the uh, impossible term uh, for plus or Maxwell is this one. So this is nonlinear. You have e uh, the Lorenz force term times Fn. And normally uh, these conservation laws give you a weak convergence, but weak convergence is not closed under products, but this uh, averaging lemma gives you strong convergence, and so uh, now you can take a you can take a limit here because you have some strong convergence. That is the uh, three minute, or I don't know how many minutes it was, but that is the short uh, outline of the proof of weak solutions. Uh, that's all I want to say. Uh, but since I want to give you a picture of the whole field, I uh, decided to explain it. Uh, so Okay, so another type of theory that you have is uh, generic uh, global solutions. Uh, this was actually an old paper of Gerhard Rhein. I believe it was his PhD thesis. Um, in recent years, uh, you've had um, papers like this for Navier-Stokes. Uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to tell you about this old paper for uh, Vlasa Maxwell. Um, so, um, yeah. So, you, so uh, consider initial data F0 with compact support and E0, B0, or C2. These are the standard, like old assumptions that people used to make in this theory. And then uh, you assume that you have a global solution that uh, satisfies these uh, bound conditions. So R0 is really, uh, it's not on the slide, but it's the constant that gives you the uh, support of uh, this is the bound on the support and then you assume that initially the derivatives of the fields have some decay and uh, for example there are other assumptions you can make but you assume that the k and the gradient of k where k are the fields uh, you assume that they decay a little bit in time and they that they decay in uh, the space-time uh, cone in this way then uh, under if you have a global solution that satisfies these bounds, then you have an open set of global solutions. So Ryan, uh, um, so for such a global solution, there's a small ball of initial data that leads to global solutions satisfying the same conditions. So given any global decaying solution, you have a ball of global solutions. So uh, you have generic global solutions in this sense. Um, yeah, so there's similar maybe from uh, results for uh, 3D Navier Stokes. Um, uh, was it, was it uh, Gallagher and Planchon? Uh, yeah, who did this, who did some d d completely different result for a com completely different equation, but they proved uh, generic global solutions for, na for 3D Navier Stokes. So you know that uh, you have an open set. Uh, the, the set of. Uh, Gallagher, Gallagher, excuse me, thank you. Gallagher, Iftimi, Planchon. Uh, prove this for uh, Navier Stokes. Okay, so that's another type of result that you can have. Uh, I won't. Um, basically, the uh, 30 second summary of that result is uh, you use the uh, so called ST decomposition uh, originally given by uh, Glassy Strauss and you um, prove estimates. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say. Since I'm going to tell you about the ST decomposition later, I'll uh, just uh, won't mention that. And I don't think I'll have time anyway. Actually, I plan to use slides and then uh, talk on the chalkboard, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, I'm making an effort to go thoroughly, slowly through these slides for students. 
Um, and uh, the chalkboard stuff will have to come tomorrow, I guess. But so this is a uh, relativistic loss of Maxwell for large velocities. Uh, this is the precursor slide to uh, glassy strauss 1986 uh, continuation criteria. So you assume that the energy is uh, finite initially. You assume the L-infinity norm is finite initially. And you assume compact support. So the soup in P such that there exists X such that the initial data is not zero, is finite. That says that the support of the distribution function uh, F is finite. And so you have uh, C1 with compact support initial data, and you have C2 uh, fields, and the fields satisfy the uh, constraints. <laughs> and then you have an, a unique uh, solution to relativistic loss of Maxwell in, uh, on a time interval. Uh, those are the assumptions. Then, uh, if you assume that the support, that the uh, distribution function is zero for large uh, momentum for all time, so you assume there exists a bounded continuous function kappa of t such that this uh, the distribution function is zero for all times, uh, or up to time t. Actually, the way I'm stating it is up to time t. Then the solution can be extended beyond t. And if this uh, kind of assumption holds for all time, then the solution can be extended globally. Actually, it's, uh, people don't really talk about it that much today, but there's a, it's on the slide, so I'll just explain it. There is a um, technical condition in glassy strasses proof that says that, uh, so to do this, you uh, approximate Glass of Maxwell, and uh, because they are using these uh, uh, CK function techniques and things like shouter estimates and these uh, th techniques that people don't use that much anymore, but they were very popular at the time. Uh, then they have to assume that uh, the uh, all, every approximation uh, sa also satisfies the same uh, compact support assumption. Um, but if you use modern techniques like uh, Sobolev spaces and energy methods, uh, then you can remove the assumption eight on the approximations by, for instance, working in H5 or H4 or some other HK. Okay, so uh, this uh, result was originally given by Glassy Strauss in 1986, and they introduced the ST decomposition of the fields, which allows you to decompose uh, E into an initial data term E0 and ES and ET, and then the the game is to estimate ES and ET successfully. Um, and then you also, uh, in 2002, you have the kleinerman staffelani approach uh, where they used uh, Fourier analysis. Um, they took the Fourier transform of the whole equation and they wrote down uh, their own Fourier space uh, representation of the fields and they uh, used Fourier-based methods to uh, prove um, the estimates, uh, but they, they, at the end of the day, they get a similar result. And you also have the Boucher, Gauss, Pollard. Uh, so these two papers are basically the same time. Uh, I don't actually know the uh, sequence, but these are the publication dates, I believe. Um, and they have a, a third representation of the fields. They express the fields EMB in terms of distributions of linear Y chart present potentials, and they use uh, what they call a division lemma. Um, I'm not really going to talk about uh, either of the last two representations at all in my course. Um, I'm only really going to talk about the ST decomposition. Uh, so um, I can explain why right now. The, the idea is uh, that uh, we want to use the conservation laws as much as possible. and. Uh, is uh, the Fourier-based uh, approach sort of kills these uh, complicated conservation laws, like the good conservation law. And it may be that someone uh, can come along and uh, figure out how to use them using Fourier methods. But number one, uh, we don't. Um, we use harmonic analysis for sure. We use it uh, quite a lot, but uh, we don't use uh, the Fourier transform um, because it hurts. Uh, the conservation laws, and um, we don't, number two, we don't know how to uh, do better. So uh, 
you can certainly use harmonic analysis, you can use the Fourier transform and try to uh, split up into terms where you don't use the conservation law in terms where you do, but I, we don't see an advantage to doing that. Uh, we haven't been, a, been able to get better estimates that way. So um, question, so here when you say conservation laws, you mean conservation laws in cones. That's, that's the point. Yes, the conservation laws in the cones, right. So you'll be writing conservation right. laws in different cones. And right. You're saying that Fourier transform is not adapted to that. Right, that's, a, that's right. It's, it's hard to think how to adapt the Fourier transform to that. Um, we don't know how to do it. And when you do it, you get a big mess. So. Um, and on top of that, uh, for all the things that we're doing, uh, the uh, harmonic analysis in uh, physical space has progressed to the point where I don't know what the advantage of doing that is. So uh, for, the, for the types of results that we're proving, there's certainly great advantage to use the Fourier transform for other uh, things that people do, but for this equation, for the types of theorems that we prove, it seems like uh, I don't know what the advantage would be. Okay, so uh, let's finish by talking about wave structure in uh, Vlasov-Maxwell. So again, you have the equation. Um, so this is a wave conference and the, uh, it's a wave semester. And the reason why I decided to talk about Vlasov-Maxwell as opposed to something else was because it has a wave equation hiding in it. And uh, here it is. So you have the uh, Maxwell's equations. Uh, you, you take a time derivative of E and you throw it onto B and J and then uh, you plug in the uh, equation for B and so you get minus the double curl of E minus J and then you just have simple vector identities uh, uh, which gives you that the Laplacian of E minus the gradient of the divergence of E from the double curl and then you have this partial TJ hanging around and you know that the uh, divergence of E is equal to rho, so you end up with uh, the gradient, the Laplacian of E minus the divergence of rho minus dTj. Um, and similarly for B, uh, you have uh, the second der time derivative of B, you pour that on E, you plug in the uh, related Maxwell equation and you get the uh, Laplacian of B minus the gradient of the divergence of B minus this curl J term and the divergence of B is zero there. So you get two, uh, so this is the wave structure for Max, plus the Maxwell and for now I just said gamma equal to plus one. Uh, uh, so a key idea in uh, all of these uh, studies of Lassa Maxwell that I mentioned is to um, write the electromagnetic fields as wave equations with a complicated forcing and I wrote out carefully uh, the complicated forcing on the right hand side. Um, so you have the integral, these integrals of dp and now you want to invert the wave operator and you want to prove estimates for E and B um, but It appears just uh, naively from looking at this that you lose uh, regularity and that is uh, a nightmare and it would be fatal if you really lose regularity. Fortunately, you don't, but there's a price to pay for not losing regularity. Um, so to prove existence results of continuation criteria, the goal is often to use this representation to get good estimates for E and B. Um, and, uh, but the basic control that we have is in terms of the previous conservation laws. You have other control, but for the sake of presentation, let me just mention that. And uh, the goal is the one big question uh, for now and for the future, for people who want to study this in the future, maybe students, is uh, do we have, uh, is there a more useful understanding of the structure of the right-hand side terms that you can use to get better estimates? Um, Right, so as I've said, the right-hand side involves derivatives, but the conservation laws do not, and this makes the uh, forcing look extremely problematic. How do you integrate by parts to remove the derivatives? That's a big uh, question. Um, and uh, in, uh, in 1986, Classy Strauss introduced a decomposition that uh, we call the ST decomposition. Um, 
So you write s as dt plus p hat uh, grad x, and then you write t as uh, grad y minus omega partial t, and omega is just the uh, normal vector y minus x over the absolute value y minus x, and uh, using this decomposition, you can uh, successfully remove the derivatives on the right-hand side. Uh, so for one, you plug in the Vlasov equation, so s of f is equal to minus e, plus p hat to f plus the Lorentz force dot pf. And then uh, you can integrate by parts in p. And then you can use the divergence theorem on the t term after inverting the wave operator. OK, so that was a bit too brief. So let me explain it in more detail. So uh, the main observation is that you can, uh, so if you are here and you have something like the gradient x, um, so this gradient p term, uh, in this p term, you can directly in take the gradient p term out because it commutes with all this stuff. And then you can just integrate by parts and get rid of it. Um, but for the gradient x terms, uh, even after inverting the wave operator, you can do that. Um, so what you do is you decompose uh, the x derivatives here, I call them y derivatives, but they're the same as this operator. So it's omega i over 1 plus p hat dot omega of s plus b i j omega comma p t j, where, t, uh, where b i j is this operator, delta i j is the standard Dirac that's uh, 1, 1 i equals j and 0 elsewhere. And then you have this omega i p j over 1 plus p hat dot omega. And you have this uh, decomposition. And as I said, S, when you have S, you can plug in the Vlasov equation and integrate by parts in the P variable. And when you have T, you can integrate by parts on the wave uh, cone. Um, so S are these uh, operators, and T are the tangential operators. And you can prove that B is bounded by uh, P0 squared. Um, and uh, that's what you get. So I just uh, said that before it were on the slide. OK, so this is the philosophy. Um, and this is what you get. I won't do the calculation. It would be quite horrendous to do so. But then uh, just for the E term, you get uh, you can decompose E as E0 plus ES plus ET, where E0 is a uh, integral of the initial data that I won't write down. But uh, you can just uh, estimate it using whatever assumptions you make on the initial data. And the EIT and EIS are these formulas up here. So you have CTX, this integral, which is what you get after inverting the wave operator. And then you have these uh, kernels HET times F dp d sigma over T minus S squared. So that's uh, more singular. And then you get this ES term, which is HE. S, uh, I, J, K, tilde, I, F, um, and K tilde is the Lorentz force. Um, and uh, omega is the normal again. And then you can uh, write down exact expressions for H, E, T, and E, T, S. Um, and they are right here. So I want to show them to you exactly because they're important to look at. Um, because this is uh, a big part of the problem. And um, so this is uh, H E T, and it's uh, 1 over p hat dot omega squared on the denominator. And then you have omega i plus p i squared in the numerator, and 1 minus p squared in the, uh, the other term in the numerator. And then you can split H E S into this uh, complicated monster. Um, I won't read it to you. Uh, so this is the problem, is uh, how do you estimate, this is uh, part of the problem, is how do you estimate these things? These are point-wide expressions. And you have a similar uh, thing for B, except it's more complicated. So EIT is uh, linear in F, and EIS is nonlinear F because you have the Lorentz force and the um, F also. Uh, OK, so it turns out that, uh, let me just write one thing on the board. I hope you can see it. Uh, it turns out that 
you can prove estimates like this. So uh, the big problem in this business is that, or one big problem in this business, is there are many, um, this is not the only one, is that uh, you get these singularities, and these singularities grow like uh, powers of P, and um, in the worst case, that's the worst estimate right there. And so if you just go through and count everything and you ignore the numerators, then uh, it looks like uh, you have a P0 squ squared, squared term from HET, and, uh, so it, so, and then uh, here it looks like you have a 1 over P0, and here it looks like you have P0 cubed. So I'm just counting this um, denominator and ignoring the numerator. And that that's, um, just kills everything. So if that, if that were actually correct, then uh, you'd just be dead and uh, throw away this equation, or, or not really, but yeah, there's nothing you can do because uh, these, this growth is, uh, is just, uh, so if you're, you're bounding f, by you use the characteristics and you're bounding f and derivative of f by e and b, and then you're bounding and f itself, and then you're bounding e and b by f and e and b again, and you do that through these expressions, and so then in addition to all that, you're losing uh, powers of p, then you're dead. Um, so it turns out that we're still dead because we don't know global existence to the system, but uh, we're not as dead as this because uh, there's a lot of cancellation in the numerators that you have to study carefully. I was going to show it to you, but I think I'm out of time. Um, but so these uh, all of these numerators uh, decay, uh, have, a have, can have a certain amount of cancellation in terms of the denominators, and that really uh, gives you a little bit of hope. And in addition to that, this uh, HS term can be split into a piece that um, is better and uh, and a piece that is not as good but can be bounded in terms of so you have a you can split es in terms of a good a good term that can be bounded in terms of the good conservation law and uh, another term that's not as singular that can't be bounded by the good conservation law so that's what you do basically you bound uh, ET directly point wise and then you do uh, more advanced things and then you split ES into two terms. One is nicer and the other uh, is uh, not as nice but boundable by the good conservation law. Okay, so let me uh, have more stuff to talk about but I have I can talk about it later. You have more time, you still oh. later, so you, you have twelve minutes. So. Oh, okay. So then I have twelve minutes. Um where should I think, where should I go? Um, okay, so... Hmm. Trying to decide what to do in 12 minutes. Okay, let me uh, explain can I stop using my board, the uh, slides? Um, Okay, so I want to tell you about um, how, to, I want to give you an idea how to prove uh, the classy Strauss continuation criteria because it's uh, instructive to a lot of what's done in this field, um, and you know, in, at least in terms of existence. So let me just write down the equation. Um,
Okay. Uh, so uh, since it's so basically, um, what I'm trying to do is give you a flavor for how you prove uh, the Glassy-Strauss continuation criterion without all the uh, headache. So um, then we have lots of Poisson, and I'm going to do this backwards because I don't know uh, how far I'll get, but I, I will. Uh, get far enough so that you have a picture. Um, so local Okay, so um, where are you going to start here? So you have uh, Vlas. So this is um, what I claim here. Uh, you can't go look it up anywhere except for in a set of lecture notes that I gave to my students in a class I taught last year. Um, but you have Vlas uh, but it's uh, it's not like original at all either. It's uh, any any expert who understands how to prove local existence in silver of spaces and understands Vlas Poisson can do this. Um, so this is Lasso Poisson that I told you about. You can prove local existence in HK, and you can prove that s the solutions are global if uh, the integral from, uh, sorry, this is not really precise. Yeah, uh, you can prove that this, let me do it this way, so I have to write less. <laughs> you can prove that the solutions are global if uh, this uh, integral is finite. You can prove that Solutions can be continued beyond capital T if the integral from zero to T remains finite, and you so you need uh, bounds on the L-infinity norms of E, the gradient of E, and the gradient in X and V of F times the weight. Let me not tell you what the weight is. Actually, I can. It's not so bad. The weight is. Uh, P0 natural log, P0 to 3 over 2, natural log of P0. What is the next board that I uh, should use? The first one. The first one, okay. I remember in someone else's talk there was a preferred uh, order. Um, so, okay. So this is what I want to prove. Um, I'm going to do this. This is global solution for more data. No. No, you have local, this is large data. Large data for Vlasov Poisson is well known. Um, and this, this is how to uh, continue a solution um, if the uh, support is compact. So, uh, theorem. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, I didn't write that. Yes, the integral is in time. Okay, so provided this integral remains? Yes. If the integral remains finite, then you have global existence. Um, and then Q of S is uh, 1 plus the soup P uh, Z here. So let Q of S, ah, uh, no, it should be T actually, but um, so here you are assuming uh, compact support initially. 
Yes. Also in. Uh, uh, what was the question? You assume compaction. Oh, um, technically, no. This local existence theorem uh, does not uh, does not require compact support. Um, but so. Um, Okay, so then uh, this is uh, if so, and if Okay, so the theorem says that if uh, Q of capital T is finite, then uh, A of S is uh, in L infinity. So in particular, it's in L1. And if T is infinity, then you, uh, then you're in, uh, oh, but uh, yeah, there's a little ambiguity because uh, if you're in L infinity, um, you don't know that you're in. So if that's finite, then uh, this is, uh, so for t equal uh, capital T equal plus infinity, this implies your uh, estimate above. Or? No, no. but uh, <laughs> we just have that the integral from zero to t is finite for every t. Exactly. Exactly. That's enough to globalize. Exactly. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then. Um, my understanding is that there is one direction which is like, let's say, trivial because if if that one is finite by finite by propagation, you know that this will also be finite. No? I mean, I think the point is really uh, this this direction, like the last, the second one. This implies this, right? You think this direction is the important one or the other one? Yeah, this one. Is the yes. One. The other one is oh, okay. So if you're compactly supported and you know that these things are finite, then it's automatic that you remain compactly supported by the conservation laws. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If yeah. initially you are compactly supported and that's finite, then you... That's right. That well. Absolutely. So the, uh, if initially you're compactly supported and you have this direction, then you have both directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, oh, that took me a long time. So, okay, so I'll say one more thing and then I'll finish. Um, this just gives you a flavor of the kind of things that you do. Okay, so take a differential operator, either being gradient x or gradient v, and then um, differentiate the equation. Uh, then you integrate along the conservation laws, so you get
Oh, I wrote this wrong. No, there. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. That's right. Okay, so if you um, so you you can uh, differentiate the equation like that, and then uh, you integrate along the conservation laws, and you get an expression like that, and then um, you bound it. So now you integrate in time along s, and you bound everything. And uh, you, what you what you end up with is um, Okay, so this is uh, roughly speaking what you get, and now um, you prove estimates and use the Gronwald's inequality. Um, uh, okay, so there's another term. Okay, so you get expressions like this, um, and now you use, these are the L infinity norms, um, and now you have to prove a hard estimate for E, and that depends upon the support, and then you uh, use Gromwell's inequality and conclude uh, that you're finite. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. You mentioned this continuation uh, result by glasser strauss Yes. Uh, if I well remember, it, it, it implies some global existence in for small data. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Uh, there's a. I, d I actually, right. I only mentioned the um, uh, generic result of Rhine just uh, because I only wanted to mention one. But there is. Uh, a huge collection of small data results for yes, uh, yes. lots of Maxwell and 3D, yeah. in particular, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, other questions for Omar? If not, okay, thank you.